Thank you. Well, it's been an absolute delight to be with you uh, for the last 24 hours. I wonder if you can put the slides up for me. Um, as uh, Andy said, uh, we spent some time yesterday in two sessions just beginning to think about how do we be church in a culture uh, where sometimes we no longer feel we fit in. Um, we talked about the idea of gathered church, what do we do together, and scattered church, what do we do in our Monday through Saturday uh, lives, how does that work out for us? And um, I wish I'd used the M&M um, <laughs> analogy because it, it fits so well that actually we were, we were called to be M&Ms from before the creation of the world. And all you've got to do is be confident about being an M&M. <laughs> And, um, but sometimes minstrels seem to get the upper hand and uh, M&Ms don't have any power and we talked about our posture when actually you are feeling powerless. And what I want to do in this third ses uh, session is simply to look at how do you engage positively? What does it mean to be a people of grace in a world that desperately, desperately wants it? A month ago, I did a funeral for a lady called Annalise, who was 50 years old, and she died of terminal cancer. She died as a Christian, and it was terminal cancer that brought her to the church. Exactly almost five years previously, she had come to the church, our church service, on the day when one of our uh, staff workers, the, the person who'd, in a sense, grown the church with me, was leaving. Um, this lady, Mary, had been with us for 15 years, and on that day, lots of people were in church, and lots of people were crying because she was leaving, which was irritating if you were staying, but <laughs> lots of people were crying because she was leaving because she was much loved. And I could see this couple uh, in the congregation, and the lady particularly was really crying. I didn't know her, so at the end of the service, I went up to her and I said, um, you know, I don't know how, you know, I clearly don't know you, but, but you must have known Mary really well because you look very upset. And she said, I have no idea who that woman is. <laughs> she said, I'm not a believer. She said, but on Friday of this week, two days before, she said, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. <laughs> I don't know how this next bit reflects one well on us as a church, but she said, and I typed in Salford Exit. And your church came up. <laughs> and she said, and I, I tapped on it. And she said, and I, I listened to you preaching. She was, and you were talking about someone called Amos. And she said, it was quite heavy. <laughs> she said, but I trusted your tone. She said, I thought, I just need to come to your church. So we chatted a little bit longer, and we arranged to meet, and that Wednesday night we met in a pub. And she said, um, she was telling her story. She said, I don't, I don't believe in God, but if there's a God, she said, either he is punishing me because me and her partner at the time, we split two marriages up to be together. She said, so it's either if there is a God, he's getting his own back. Or if there's not a God, it's simply meaningless. And I sat and we chatted for ages. And I said to her, can I tell you a better story? Can I tell you a better story? And we talked about creation and fall and Jesus and restoration and eternity. And in time, she became a Christian, and she was baptized, and she walked faithfully with Jesus. It was tough, but she walked faithfully with Jesus. And when we did the service for her a month ago, I explained to everybody else who was there how she trusted a better story. You see, the truth is, we live in a culture and a society that may or may not think that we are relevant. That's not the point. The point is we are called to be a people who are confident that we're living a better story. I came across this uh, um, massive painting on top of a garage in London. And when I saw it, 
It was one of those images that you see and you quickly want to take a picture because you think that's what it's about. That's what this life's about. Actually, how do we love beyond our natural borders? How do we be a people who are? And what I want to do very quickly this morning is talk about what does love look like? What does it mean to be a compassionate people? What does it mean to be a confident people? And what does it mean to be a creative people in a culture that may or may not find you relevant? You see, I think the deal is this. We ought not, as a church, to be desperately trying to be relevant. I think what we need to be as a church is desperately authentic. I think that the, the, the running after relevance is... It's a busted flush. You'll always be chasing something. And if church wants to be relevant, then actually what you'll end up looking like is a very pale imitation of what everybody else is doing. But actually, if we can be authentic, we can tell a better story. To those who don't believe. To those who don't understand. To those who don't see what's relevant. So, very quickly, let me explore with you. Uh, We've been using 1 Peter, the epistle that Peter writes to the Christians who are scattered across Turkey. And um, uh, we've not been doing exposition, but we've just been sort of like dipping in and out of it and trying to make sense of how his letter to the Christians in his day, by extension, might have something to say to us today in 2022. So if you've got a Bible, can you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8? Uh, Yesterday we were looking at 1 Peter 1 and 2, and today just 1 Peter 3 verse 8. And this is how uh, Peter writes to his church and says, finally, all of you, Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil with evil uh, or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so you may inherit a blessing. For whoever among you would love life and see good days must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. Don't fear their threats. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And I'll pause there. What does it mean to be a compassionate group of people, compassionate community builders? We, um, uh, our church in Salford, Um, We don't have our own worshipping space, so we share an Anglican church building. And the congregation have been, that Anglican congregation has been absolutely fantastic to us. Uh, They're a small small group of uh, people, mostly elderly, but they've been so welcoming. They have just given us a generous welcome to another congregation. And uh, we are so blessed by them. And in that congregation of Anglicans, there's one little lady called Ivy. And Ivy is a Salford salt of the earth type. No airs and graces, says it as she sees it. And she's a little, I mean, she's 85, but she's a little intimidating, if you know what I mean. She's four foot ten, but actually, you wouldn't want to meet her in a dark alley. (laughs) And Ivy came up to me the other week, two weeks ago, and said, Neil, there's something about your people. And I'm going, oh, Lord. What have we done? She said, you just smile a lot. And then she said, it's not just you. It's everybody. What is it with you? Like it's some big accusation. 
There's something about an attractive community of people who are like-minded, sympathetic, who love one another, who are compassionate, and who are humble. And the more you lean into those characteristics, the more you learn those things. Because to be honest, and I don't want to be offensive, but these are not natural characteristics for us to have. We come from a world that doesn't actually praise humility. I don't know how many of you have staff reviews or annual reviews at work, but I, I almost guarantee that in your appraisal, they're not saying, so how humble are you? That is not a quality that the world, your employer, thinks is worth chasing after. Your employer is not looking to see how sympathetic you are. Your employer is looking to see how productive you are. Do you get things done? Is the bottom line the bottom line? And here in this community, we go, no. Well, those things may have their place, but here... We are less interested in what you achieve than in your relational capacity one for another. We're less interested in whether we are sparkly and brilliant and the best show in town. And we're much more interested in can we offer a different view of what humanity can be together. Because in this place, it doesn't matter one jot whether you've got two PhDs or whether you never passed a GCSE. In this place, it doesn't matter whether you're earning three fig uh, six-figure salaries or you're on minimum wage or less. In this place, we don't grade you like that. In this place, it doesn't matter whether you've got really brilliant giftings from God or whether actually the only thing you can do competently is sweep a floor. In this place, it doesn't matter one jot. Because in this place, you and I belong to one another in Christ. And we together have an opportunity to demonstrate to a watching world, what could the rest of the world be like? And by the way, the other thing about being a compassionate community of people together is there's a whole stack of people down your street and down my street who are aching for relationships that, where they know they're accepted. Most of us live most of our lives asking two very straightforward existential questions. Am I good enough? And am I lovable? And those two questions drive us into all sorts of dysfunctional behaviors. Am I good enough? Some of us who are workaholics are desperately trying to answer that question. And we're doing it in the, all the wrong places. Am I lovable causes some of us to continually and constantly and serially get into relationships that are not good for us, but we're desperately trying to find, am I lovable? And in this place, we say you're loved by Christ and we will love you. And in this place, it's not about being good enough. You're valued. And so church becomes a healing community. Now, we know that you know, God heals. We know that through ministry and, and all the rest of it, God heals. But actually, to be honest, you know what? That's true, and, and we need that. We need counseling. We need the ministry of deliverance and prayer ministry. We need all of those aspects of life. But it's the way you deal with one another that becomes the healing community here. You all have a part to play. What does it look like when the church, when we no longer fit in? We're compassionate community builders. Here, we're a community of character formation. We're learning a different response to the world. And of course, if we can do it here, then it'll spill out to wherever we may be. The second thing is, we are people who are gospel confident. Peter says, in your hearts, revere 
Christ as Lord. We are witnesses of something. We are not a sales force. But we're witnesses of a different truth. And we are confident in the gospel. And we are not ashamed to allow people to see how does this life make sense. Revere Christ as Lord. The decisions you make, the responses you offer. Some of you, uh, because you've told me, did the fruitfulness on the frontline course at LICC and we were part of preparing. And, and some of you have said how much uh, it was helpful to you. If you've not done it, I would recommend you do it. But in that course, essentially, what we were trying to do in, in a course, thinking through, well, what does a, a personal mission strategy look like? Essentially, we said two things. It's about consistency and it's about courage. Consistency and courage. That every time, because of Jesus, what you see is what you get. That you model the godly character. That you do your work to the glory of God. That you do minister love and grace wherever you are. Just consistently, day in, day out. You'll have good days and you have bad days. But people know around you that actually this person is a person of some weight. Because actually you can trust them. They're just consistent. And then courage. There are times where you go, actually, things are not working well around here in our office. We're going to make some changes. Our family is dysfunctional. I'm going to speak up and say, we've got to stop treating each other like this. And it's never easy to do that. But we're going to mold the culture around us. We're going to stand up for truth and justice. I've got people in my church, women in my church, who took a stand and said, in, in one setting, one of our folks said, I said to the senior management on more than one occasion, I think what we're doing is absolutely wrong. And they didn't, ignored me every time. And in the end, she said, the only thing I can do is resign. Because uh, we cannot, I cannot keep on in this context where truth and justice are not, are not being followed through. And I've got another woman who essentially went into a local authority and found a whole way, a set of ways that, to be honest, the authority were failing people. And she became a whistleblower, knowing that she might lose a job. Now, she didn't. And then the, finally, what does it mean to be a messenger of the gospel? What does it mean to speak out about this faith? Consistency and courage. Revere Christ as Lord, but then let it flow through the rest of it. I, the worship has been brilliant this morning. It's been brilliant to sing these songs together. It's been brilliant to sing the spontaneous songs. It's been brilliant to see how you've responded to that. And you know what I'm going to say next. But if it stops here, then why and what's the point? You may enjoy Jesus. Good. But revering Christ as Lord says, I'm realigning my life in the light of the kingship of Jesus. Consistent and courageous. We used this as a definition of disciple yesterday. Someone learning the way of Jesus in my context at this stage of my life. What does this look like for you? We're called to be compassionate, a compassionate community in which certain character formation is, being, is happening. We're called to be confident in the gospel. I wish I had the rest of the day just to unpack all of this stuff. You're glad I don't. You didn't need to say. But the third C is... We need to be a creative people. We need to be a creative people. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. The two massive assumptions that Peter makes in this statement are these. Firstly, that people will want to know, why are you like you are? What is it about you? that generates a different response? What is it about you that means your actions are so different? People notice. 
What is it about you? And people will ask, well, when they ask, be ready. But then the other aspect of this, but do it with gentleness and respect. You know, sometimes people, sometimes Christians, we're, we're our own worst enemies, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, we know the gospel is a stumbling block, but some Christians really, really go out of the way to make sure that they are also a stumbling block. <laughs> Many years ago, I was at uh, a Bible college as a student, and uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, I had to take a long bus ride out to a Baptist church in the middle of nowhere to uh, gain experience of church with a Baptist minister who was the rudest man in England. I, don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's any Baptist heritage people here, but I don't know what on earth they were thinking of to accept him. But the worst thing about this guy from my perspective was he was really rude, but he was also an evangelist. So he took me out on the doors knocking all around his town. Every Wednesday, we spent from 2 o'clock till 5 o'clock, and then blow me down, we had tea, and then we went out at 6 o'clock till 8 o'clock. <laughs> the worst year of my life. Because <laughs> essentially, his policy was, and he said it to me loads of times, he said, Neil, I, I said to him, I mean, I was 18, so I was very, I, so I knew everything. So I said to him, <laughs> I said, you're really rude. <laughs> And he said, we won't see these people again, don't worry. <laughs> and I have to tell you, he was right. <laughs> he was exactly right. He had the remarkable knack of making extraordinary good news seem like the worst news you could ever have in your life. How do you do it with respect? And how do you do it with gen gentleness? Let me tell you three stories. One's mine, two is other people's. When um, the BBC, when Media City was just opening up, um, lots of the sort of researchers who are often very young in the BBC um, needed to get in touch with local ministers to help them out as they were developing the religious department down there. And so for no other reason than I was in when she rang, um, they invited me to be part of the audition for a Sunday morning, what would become a Sunday morning religious program. I wasn't ever going to be part of that on a Sunday morning. I was just helping them as they worked out who their presenters would be. And what they did was they got me as a minister and then an ardent atheist to have a conversation with, I think, six groups of two presenters each. Now, this atheist was not your common gardener, apathetic atheist. He stood outside altering and Baptist, giving tracts out about why you shouldn't go into church. He was, like, really on it. He was an evangelistic atheist. So when we met, we met in the green room, when we met, he, his first words to me, he said, so you're the idiot. <laughs> so I said, so you're the one going to hell. <laughs> and we got on like a house on fire after that, pardon the pun. And, um, and, and because we spent most of the day together um, rehearsing these, what became very hackneyed conversation pieces, in the end, I, I, I just asked him a question. I said, Did you, have you ever had an experience that you just... Because he was really... He just said, there's nothing other than you can see, feel, or touch. Or I said, Do you, have you ever had an experience you can't explain? And he said, well, once I was in my house, on my own. He said, and I heard a voice saying to me, just shut up. <laughs> Which is true, it's true. And very gently, I told him the story of the transfiguration. About how Peter had a moment where God said to him, just shut up and watch something else happen. And I suggested gently that maybe God was trying to get his attention. I was really trying to do it. I mean, gentleness, it had to be quite a forceful gentleness with him. But with respect. 
And asking the questions actually allows people to tell you what they're thinking. I've got a friend of mine who works in the university in Manchester. And one day she saw her colleague coming down the road, uh, down the corridor rather, and, and her colleague was really visibly upset. And she stopped him and, and said, you know, how you doing, etc. And he told her what was going on and why he was so upset. And she asked what I thought was a brilliant question. She said, do you have any resources, any inner resources for a day like this? Now, isn't that a good response? And he said, I don't know. I don't know I have. What do you do? And she said, well, I, I pray. Do you fancy a coffee? I thought the response was brilliant. Because it's gentle and it's respectful. I met a guy who um, did Saturday morning hockey with his boys. He was like the, um, I don't know, the manager, I guess, the, the organizer. And uh, he was saying to me, he said, I was watching all these fathers watching their sons play hockey, thinking, how will I ever see these guys come to know Jesus? He said, so I came up with a strategy of four tables. He said, there's a work table. For him, the work table was just managing the boys' hockey team. He said, essentially, I've got to be as good a hockey team play, uh, manager as I can be. I've got to treat these boys with real respect. If I, if I fail at that point, I fail at everything. It's the work table. He said, my second table is either a, a pub table or a coffee table, where I just have the chance to get to know one other person. Say, tell me about yourself. Can I get to know you? It's a coffee table. Or pub table. So my third table is a dining table because I invite people to come and meet my friends and we share food together and they work out that sometimes Christians can be quite normal. <laughs> now clearly you didn't invite everybody from his church <laughs> for that, but just some. And he said, and the fourth table is the Lord's table. He said, but the jump from the work table to the Lord's table is often too great a leap. He said, so I work as well as I can. I want to know people. I don't want to just get a coffee table so I can tell them what I believe. I want to know who they are. Because God's been at work in these people before I got there. And I want them to know that actually faith is not just a series of propositions, but it's actually about a way of life together. And that's why we eat together. And then... I might want to invite them to come and worship with us. Now, you may have thoughts about that. You may think it's, it wouldn't work for you. I, I really don't mind. I just thought it was really impressive that he had a strategy that was gentle and respectful and allowed people to ask, so how do you do it? I'm coming to an end. I read this and I thought, this is what we are. In the daily rhythms for everyone, everywhere, we live our lives in the marketplaces of this world, in homes and neighborhoods, in schools and on farms, and in hospitals and in business, and our vocations are bound up with the ordinary work that ordinary people do. We are no great shots across the bows of history. Rather, by simple grace, we are hints of hope. I wish I'd written that. You would think so much more highly of me if I'd written that. <laughs> but isn't it a great quote? Yeah. Just look at it again. Just read it for yourself. <coughs> That's what we are. Hints of hope. And in one sense, it doesn't really matter it really doesn't matter on one sense, in one sense, if we no longer seem to fit into society. We remain hints of hope. We're people who carry a better story. We're people who are called to live it out here. People who have revered Christ as Lord in our hearts and we allow that to flow out. And we're people 
who are creative in our responses. My time's gone. And so without any sort of desire to be emotional or to raise the sort of the emotional bar in the room, I want to give a chance for us to pray, for you to be prayed with. And this is how we're going to do this. We've been concerned about the gathered church and the scattered church. Now, for some of you, your primary vocation and your primary sort of interest, your pri- the thing you give most of your time for is gathered church. Some of you are leaders of churches. Some of you are, have a lot of um, discretionary time and you give that time to your local church and you're involved in food banks or camp centers or children's work or youth work and that when you pray that's the thing you pray about most because that's your real sort of primary location for your service for God but there's others of you that actually 60 hours of your week you're elsewhere and you're in schools and you're in offices and you're in hospitals You're with families, you're building businesses, you're working in a factory maybe, but you folks, 60 hours of your week is taken up by that paid employment stuff. We're going to pray, you are the scattered church. And I I simply want to say, please don't ever think that the people who concentrate on the gathered church have the easier task. You are in the right place. You're the hints of hope scattered across Greater Manchester and the Northwest, and Ormskirt particularly, because I didn't mention them yesterday. <laughs> We're going to pray for you separately. For those of you for whom the church, the gathered church activities, where most of your thinking, most of your time is spent, do you want to just stand for a moment? Now, some of you will go, well, I'm in both. If you're in both and you have a real scattered mission ministry, wait. But if it's your church, then stand now. Just stand. Okay. Now visually, this is exactly what you'd expect to see. There are fewer people whose primary vocation is in the gathered church, who's sort of like, that's their, that's their main thing. And it's brilliant that you are. It's brilliant that you are, because we need you. I, I would stand at this point if it were me. I, I, well, I am standing, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you think I'm sort of 10 foot tall and actually... <laughs> this is exactly... But can you see what this means... Visually, can you see what this means? That the church and the power of the church and the hope of the church is in its scattered life because there's simply more of you scattered around. Can you see it? But these people are really significant. So it's not we're diminishing. It's actually that we need these people to be anointed by God that they might be people who enable communities of compassion to be formed, who do teach really well, who do pastor and disciple us so that we might be the people of God. Yeah? Do you want these people to do really well? Come on, let's face it. You've got got skin in this game. (laughs) Would some of you stand with them and just put your hand on their shoulder if that's okay, if that's appropriate? We're going to pray for them. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you give the church. Thank you for these people who stood. For these people who spend so much of their time thinking about our gathered church activities. Thank you for those preachers that are here. Thank you for the worship leaders. Thank you for the children's workers and those who are engaged in the church outreach to their communities. Thank you for those who disciple people. Thank you for those who pastor. Thank you that they are the gifts of God to the church body. And we honor them and we want you to pour out your spirit upon them. That they would need a new refreshing. Lord, sometimes we are not easy to lead. 
Lord, we want to pray that you give them a renewed, refreshing, anointing, and a vision for what you want them to do. But Lord, we thank you for them. And Lord, as we stand around them, may they know that on the days that are the tough days, they're not on their own, that we value them and we support them. Lord, may your hand rest on them, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, now you guys can sit down. Now, it doesn't take a PhD in theology to work out what's going to happen next. <laughs> if you know that most of your life you're in scattered mode, do you want to stand? Can you see what this means? We simply don't have time to know where you are this morning normally, you know, your, where your scattered life is. But you know, and much more significantly, the Father knows. This, you are the people called to be compassionate, called to be confident, and called to be creative. Now there's a whole stack few of people sitting down. So you're going to get prayed for in bulk. <laughs> but if you're sitting down, do you want to just find two or three and stand with them and do the best we can? It's important actually that these people know that they're not on their own. It's important to know because sometimes it can feel like you're a bit lonely out there. And let me tell you, those of you that stand, most of you, most of the time will feel that you're not doing a good enough job. But that's not how the Father sees you. And we want to pray for you that you would know the blessing of God. I want to thank you for these folks who stood. I want to thank you for the fact that you have put your hand upon their life. And I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would just rest upon them. That, Lord, you would enable them to continue to live these lives of compassion, of confidence, and of creativity in their context. Lord, I pray that they'll find their voice there. Lord, we believe you're a God who releases our tongues. We spoke about it earlier, about how actually your angels come and release our speech. Lord, do it tomorrow morning in the office. Do it tomorrow in the school. Well, it's bank holiday, isn't it? We won't be there. <laughs> do, do, do it on Tuesday, Lord. Do it wherever we find ourselves. Do it wherever we... Release our tongues, we pray. Our minds that are... We might know what to say and when to say it. And Lord, make us creative. Lord, make us compassionate for people around us. Make us confident that we're in the right place with the right people at the right time. Lord, may your spirit rest upon us. May you anoint us. May you give us a vision for those places. And may you empower us to serve you well. In the name of Jesus. Amen.